Thank you for um, coming to our our city. It's nice that the world um, world comes to us uh, for a change. Can you hear this? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thanks. No, uh, it's great to see this gathering here, really, uh, because it's. Um, I think somebody said yesterday morning that um, it's uh, kind of incredible how ideas travel between people, maybe Kotemok. And uh, uh, it's really um, something that we are watching in front of us, this kind of discourse network unfold. But today, briefly, because we have 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about something which is a bit on the other side of this, um, this kind of um, distribution type of question, right? I think it's, uh, briefly, it's uh, the question of how um, we are able to change given or long-lasting or concrete, uh, like the, the building we are in, uh, environmental conditions, yeah? Like the city that we inherit, right? The emperor is dead, but we still use his palaces. Uh, the streets going to the, the road going to the, to the old um, ports. Um, uh, don't go to the ships anymore, but we still use them. And so on. Like Clark House, where we were yesterday. Yeah? This kind of idea. That there is possible a change of balance, uh, which is uh, Jameson's great word, uh, in, the, in, the, in the way that we... Um, what kind of looks almost the same can have a different destiny, can be pushed in a different direction. And because we cannot really erase the century of industrial capitalism, right? We are not, uh, that's not what we're trying to do. We are trying to make it turn into another thing, or even urban development, right? So as artists, the kind of, and also people who work with technology, this intuition or this experience is that things are kind of delicately assembled and they can be uh, destabilized. And that's kind of what we mean by infrastructure, a word that has, has lots of uses these days. But we're trying to describe a little bit through our, through our projects what that would be. It's a kind of level that we try to engage with. And to put it in one sentence, it's like, uh, which I just invented, give me something not to look at, but something to stand on, which changes the way the world looks. So we could start then with two short commentaries, because I think the larger situation is, is actually quite familiar. Uh, and these are like short images, and then we'll go to some project descriptions, right? Uh, I have, uh, I've had this sense uh, also for a while, but it kind of concretized at a film conference. Some of you were in Delhi last, at CSDS last year, that uh, I just noticed that in gatherings like this, there were lots of scholars talking about, uh, say, affect, right, in relation to film, where, while the filmmakers and the artists were talking uh, about, on the other hand, kind of things that drove them seemingly quite different things like concepts and uh, processes and weird digital uh, kind of objects that could be produced, right? But very, very little about what could be uh, the point of view of the viewer's experience of it somehow, right? They were talking about something like a political economy of making art, let's say, right? which is different from how it was being understood or received, I guess. Because it seems like that, and maybe that is because it seems to us uh, practitioners that, you know, here, here is the possibility for doing something new. Here is the possibility for sensing uh, something rather than being sensed, right? Or here's the possibility to, to watch, to count, to see, rather than to be watched, to be counted in one sense, right? How to, how to push your senses back through the networks that are sucking at us, as we know. And maybe this has something to do with a kind of 1925 concept. I think the author is Boris Arvatov. Uh, the Russians here could correct me, but I found this recently where he flips around Marx's commodity and makes it another kind of thing, a thing that in his extreme uh, cases is, is like a comrade, right? this co-conspirator, this thing who, who, who travels with you. And it's the difference, I think, between kind of creating an aesthetic uh, rather than an anesthetic relationship with the object. Right? So not only the shock of technology or encounters with the world, but a kind of extension of the senses. Right? That would be the aesthetic rather than the, than the, than the kind of uh, screen. 
or then, then, the, then the blockage or the, or, the, or, the, or the shock of it or the surprise of it. So that's one uh, kind of thought, this, this, this comrade objects, these extended comrade objects. How far can we extend them? What's the, what's the size of our imagination? So here's a, a, another set of small images. Yeah? Uh, we can't, uh, and this is a little bit to do with uh, a friend of ours uh, whose film was made in our studio, uh, traveled on foot to this uh, place in uh, central India, Janjgir Champa and Korba uh, districts in Chhattisgarh, where there are 39 power plants coming up in two districts, like two small districts in central India, in village locations, right? So what do you see when you go through these villages on foot? Like, it's a remarkable project, right? He's going through just, you know, two kilometers and there's another one, right? There's another one. Is this, like, the city somehow extended back into the extended, this kind of urban? Is it the... So it appears, you know, behind cricket pitches, everywhere. And it's a remarkable, or is this the kind of future rural, like what is it? Is it the, the edges of what Lefebvre, I think, described in a less known, maybe, aspect of his writing as the city as a, as a bonfire, as a constantly blazing bonfire, which has to be fed, and then it needs water to put those fires out, right? As we were talking about at lunchtime yesterday, Water does not reach the apartment. Tankers have to come. Um, it's, a, it's an energy question as well. Like how much energy do we have? How can we use this, right? So the problem is that, the problem in these, while talking about these large-scale phenomena, even conceptually, notionally for this, for this moment, is that, you know, it is, it's, it's uh, this is, uh, you know, in the back of the school, and as you come close to it, you don't really see or know more, right? You, you see certain things. Uh, you have to go around it. You, you, f you have to find a way, for example, to understand how the power plant operates in the village. You have to see that the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Projects, which have been initiated by the power plant as after it has taken over the land, have a certain presence in the village, usually a failed one, like this uh, bore well, which is uh, not uh, actually giving any water. But if you, if you engage with it at this level, I'm showing you pictures that uh, were somehow not part of the film that it was made eventually, because of the reason that uh, many of them were not used, because of the reason that this did not tell us what, or it was hard to relate these kind of stark images to what the function of these things might be, right? Or what's the threat exactly? So there's this kind of weird split between what you see and what something does, right? Jaisa dikta hai, waisa karta nahi hai, or the other way around, right? And art also, you may say, historically rides on this doubt between what the thing is, what it does, what it could do, right? There, is, there are gaps here. And maybe the work of artists, there's a lot of work to do because of the context of industrial capitalism uh, of the last century in this kind of scenario is to turn the, those gaps into the aesthetic and not the anesthetic, right? How to, how to find a way of encountering this. Because there is no longer black smoke even coming out of these chimneys, right? So there goes the imagery of the great English poets and William Blake and uh, the, the towers of, uh, you know, the, the factories of London and perhaps those used in the... Uh, there's another, actually, Mexican estudentistas, if I'm pronouncing that right, tradition, where you invoke these images of the factory. But it's not... That's not even what's what's happening here. So you have to look elsewhere. You have to look at other processes which, which the film does. Um, and one example of that is to find where the ash goes, which is the thing that's not coming out of the chimney anymore because of the filtering of the, the, the production, but it ends up in these vast and like thousands of tons per day uh, landscapes of pure ash coming out of 
these dozens of power plants in a rural uh, kind of Indian context. Um, so that's just a couple of images to start you off. And then we'll, we'll do two little stories from our work, which I think Shaina will lead. Thanks. So the first, uh, first little story is actually from a city of firsts, the city of Manchester, the first industrial city in the world. Cottonopolis, we, Bombay shares quite a history with Manchester. This is another city of firsts. It had the first public library, the Cheatham Library, where actually Engels used to hang out and wrote the condition of the working class in England. His father ran a cotton mill there. This is also the city and the library where Marx and Engels later hang out and write uh, the Communist Manifesto. Um, this is also the city which had the largest IRA bombing on UK soil to date, which was in 1996. The bomb blew up uh, a mall called the Undale Mall, which was a fairly modest, kind of rundown, decrepit shopping center in what by then, uh, the first industrial city of Manchester, this downtown city of Manchester, by then was called Gunchester, right? So the IRA bomb happens, and the news reports say things like, uh, saved by the bomb, every dark cloud has a silver lining. Um, and there begins uh, another first project, um, that of Manchester City's regeneration. And it becomes one of these exemplary model regeneration projects that then, you know, the United Kingdom does to Leeds, Birmingham, and London, East London, and so on. Um, one of the, um, uh, I guess one of the uh, uh, infrastructural changes that happened in this moment of regeneration in the UK was an extensive uh, CCTV network, right? Open street surveillance, uh, uh, wires that go into the built environment, and into you know, into some grid, and then into some control room somewhere where there is a, uh, a an image, or rather hundreds of images uh, or visuals of a second city, right? A virtual city. We know this. We know one camera for every ten in the UK, and so on. But again, it's it start happened somewhere um, in Manchester. Anyway, back to that little mall, the Undale Mall that blew up. When they rebuilt it is in this uh, great regeneration project, they actually built another first, the largest mall, uh, the largest mall in Europe. And so the Arndale Mall, which was in this old historic city center, extended its footprint, right? And went across the Cotton Exchange, the Royal uh, Exchange, which was then later called the Royal Exchange, uh, Coronation Street, almost touching this Cheatham Library, uh, this big mall vector of capitalism, if you will, just becomes large. Um, 2008, 26th March, and some days in and around there, to be precise, we are inside this mall. We just entered it, and we're somehow inside this control room. And uh, through a process um, that I don't want to kind of describe too much, but um, we managed to get out the footage from these 208 cameras that were just controlling this indoor mall. And it's immediate outside. You saw him walk in and then come out. Um, as this film progresses, it's mundane. You will say, where's the artist? Where's the lens-based frame you created? What the hell does CAM do? We don't get it. <laughs> Somewhere through this, these structures will get revealed. This extensive, uh, uh, not only views of a lot of those 208 cameras, but their pan zoom functions, their degrees. That's a historic street, Cannon Mall. The Cheatham Library goes there next to it. So it's a weird new imprint of that city, right? This, the, the, the metadata, the extensive coverage, the match cut continuity, which is, you know, he exits one gully or one door, caught from the next camera going entering from here. Then he exits and goes up the escalator. And he's caught from there. Familiar language for us, but stuff we don't see. We don't consider. 
um, um, and we don't we don't think uh, this is what artists need to enter or this so for us we're like there are 200 cameras there one has to understand them one has to somehow um, and I'm not just saying make visible but somehow grapple with this this weird infrastructure. Um, I'll just fast forward a bit. As the kind of film pro pro progresses, people meet each other, they swarm, they talk, they hang out. This mall looks like it's kind of closing. It goes on and slowly you see um, Halley Square. That's another, it's a square, right, where the mall stood. It's not the square inside the mall, but it has this kind of imprint of the city. Um, um, but you start seeing the structures. You see the Can control give room. Me a clue where they are? Um, you see another room where the control room operators are being watched. Where I'm walking. Um, yeah, so the so course, there they are now. It's so lost to be set. Um, so the camera there. So yeah, this is just an extreme um, 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 infrastructure. That I mean, I, I'm giving you this very extreme example, but this is where we somehow try to go. Artists do have privileges. Why the hell am I there after like needing a visa and iris scan and 10 fingerprints every time I go to the UK is probably because I do have certain privileges, uh, even as an artist, right? Okay, banned from UAE right now, rated enemy of the state in Tel Aviv, but okay, we still have certain privileges um, and we like to do things larger than what one solo artist can do, so we always work collaboratively. Um, in this case, I have to say, if, you, if you're really inspired about occupation, it may not need to be a big banner on a state building. You really need to collaborate with CCTV control room operators. Really, you can, you can take down anything once you have with you this realm of hidden cameras and, and the sort of visibility that it... I mean, one guy, one girl there uh, decides to, to do a mutiny or, or uh, be your friend and, like, text you and, and network, you can, you can occupy the mall, you can shut down an airport or, um, or whatever. Um, this is somehow, um, this project in many ways is, um, has been preceded by um, a whole other body of work that, that we've been doing. Um, from around 2004, we were working with other infrastructures, um, FM radio, um, cable TV operators, and I think our, our early ways of working were always to either parasite the infrastructure, um, um, piggyback on it, as we did working with local, local cable operators, or create... Um, so in, in a case like this, it's... Uh, neighborhood, uh, it's, an, it's an infrastructure that gets created by coupling. Um, um, this is before going to the UK and seeing that extensive camera network, but these little uh, $10 cameras have come into, and these little splitter boxes have come to Lamington Road in 2006. And so um, the, the, the Hardy cable and uh, I know Prasad will invoke this better than me, but this kind of terrestrial coax cable that used to crisscross uh, our cities not till not very long ago and come into the bum of your TV. Uh, so how we couple cable TV and, and uh, um, um, CCTV to create these televisual uh, neighborhood uh, uh, networks. Um, this is... Okay, this follows soon after from... Um, um, from the Manchester project, we get inspired by that endless panel zoom and take one little camera um, to um, the city of Jerusalem where um, um, Palestinian residents film uh, from the safety of their home, uh, deploying this panopticon view, this panel seemingly infinite zoom, but can and are able to speak of, of things very close to them, the window of the house they were born in, things really far, like the new wall that's gerrymandering their space, uh, but also memories, and are able to somehow, with some confidence and a, and a kind of control over their landscape, evoke that feeling of what it is to be living under that permanent state of exception, but somehow 
I don't know. You, you don't see them. There's, 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 uh, they're not victims. Suddenly, they, they can tell the story on their own. Do I have time? I'm going to go to the other extreme, which is a kind of uh, how do you... Leaks have emerged as kind of one cogent media form, right? It becomes a rupture in structures of power. And when the WikiLeaks happen, the cynic will say, but I know what the U.S. did in Iraq. Like, halas, I know. Like, so, but, but between the news scandal and the vast data dump is this kind of possibility and a place where one can really sense things. It's unprecedented. These are ruptures where information leaks from the corridors of power. And I think we artists have to think about how we grapple with this. I had a much longer thing to say, but maybe I will just play um, a little bit. So in 2009, um, just get this on because Gitanjali put her video on. In 2009, um, um, the phones of a corporate lobbyist were tapped. She happened to be the lobbyist for Tata and Ambani, our two largest uh, oligarchs. Um, and um, these leaks, um, I think 200 phone calls were leaked out. They, um, you should, you should, you should hear the tapes. The films are online. But um, um, here she is networking the phone and brokering these kind of public-private partnerships. Um, the 200 tapes were crowdsourced. Xenia here put them into Padma, which is predominantly an image-based archive, but suddenly it was dealing with these like 8-bit audio taps. Uh, somehow we were, be, we were able to distill it because we do run these autonomous platforms such as Padma in collaboration with many people here um, for many years now. Um, I think, so there were two... I don't know, I don't want to speak about it without showing it. But we, brought, we, we distilled that work into two media forms. One was a screenplay, which kind of gave the, um, these audio tapes fictitious or rather real settings. Um, and a threat of a film, a threat of a film but that actually used the transcripts. And in the second thing, of course, the veracity of these tapes were constantly being debated and so we said, if we need to edit them, let's edit them. And so we borrowed again from film and montage, and, and um, that was the clip I wanted to show you. But I'll end here, um, and maybe in the Q&A we can, we can discuss these a little more. <laughs> 